current culture, I'm afraid that many of us are growing desensitized to the stench of sin. You turn on the news and all that you seem to be bombarded with is bad news. Murders, bombings, racial injustices, terror attacks, you name it. On a more personal level, we can jump on Facebook and we come face to face with friends and family who are dealing with sickness and loss and pain, doubts, depression, anxiety, maybe even suicidal tendencies. With social media, now we're having bad news thrust in front of us more than ever before. And one of the unfortunate side effects is that many of us are growing numb to the hurt in the world around us. As we continue in our Bible class about disconnect and what it means to be first century Christians in a 21st century world, we want to talk about the idea of growing numb and becoming desensitized to the world around us. Can that be a problem for us as a Christian? Can it remove us so far from the idea of having compassion for humanity and mankind that we truly lose the meaning of what it means to follow Christ and to have the mind of Christ that we read about in Philippians 2 and verse 5. Thank you for being here for our Bible class. Certainly look forward to being back together with our church family, whenever that might be. If you're watching with us today and you're not a part of our family here at Cary, I'm glad that you've chosen to, to be with us during this time of Bible study as we continue to look at how social media and the internet and all of those things can affect us but also help us as Christians. Let's start with a word of prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy great and glorious name. Father, we humbly approach you now as we bring these petitions of prayer before you, first and foremost with thanksgiving always that we are your children and the blessings that come with that. We thank you for Jesus who enables us to be able to approach your throne of grace and mercy at this hour. And Father, we're thankful for this study that we can continue to open up your word in the world in which we live today to find the meaning of what it means to be a Christian and how we walk in this world but more importantly, how we show the world who Christ is because of our actions. Father, help us to always be strong and courageous, even during these difficult times, not only as we're facing this, this virus and those that are struggling with it, these things that are keeping us apart, but also of the, the struggles that we're facing in our country, Father, of the social injustices and the racial things that are taking place. Father, help us to always remember that we're Christians, but Father, also help us to remember that we need to see people through the eyes of Christ, to have compassion for one another, to understand one another, to listen to one another. And Father, help us to always remember who we represent and how we walk as your children, to always shine that light and to always show people what it means uh, to be Christians and how we might show that love as Christ did and the examples that he gave us so many times. Father, help us to always have an open mind as we go through this study. Help us to apply these things daily to our lives as we need to, uh, to always reflect upon ourselves as Christians that we might be better tomorrow than we are today. And that comes with reflection and, and also understanding how we need to grow in our faith as the Bible tells us. Father, we pray for those among us in our church family who might be struggling with some type of physical illness or ailment. We pray for them. We pray for those who are dealing with cancer issues, those who might be going through treatments that you might do something to um, bother, or rather watch over them, that we might do something to help them and to encourage them. Father, we also pray for those who are struggling spiritually or emotionally or mentally with something. Father, help us not to grow desensitized to those around us. And Father, we understand it's difficult because of the separation, because of this virus, but help us to do whatever we can to continue to reach out to each other to encourage one another and to lift each other up. Father, we lift up our elders before you, bless their hands, give them guidance, give them wisdom, give them strength. We're thankful for their, uh, their love and resilience and guidance thus far and helping to make sure that we stay safe while at the same time staying connected, to be with them and their families also, to be with all of us as a family as we're separated, to remember who we are in you. Father, we are so grateful for Jesus. We're thankful for his love, for the compassion he had towards us at Calvary, for the love that you extended towards us even when we didn't deserve it. Father, thank you for sending your son to us that we might receive that eternity with you. Father, go with us as you always do. Thank you for loving us. Forgive us when we fail you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. So when we think about this idea of growing numb and becoming desensitized, I think many of us 
see it so frequently that we become desensitized to the pain and struggle in people's lives. And we have to really make sure that doesn't happen with us as Christians. I think this desensitization can happen for two reasons. First, as, as, it, as I mentioned earlier, we can become desensitized because it happens over and over and over. Perhaps you see a friend on social media that posts many times about an illness or a struggle that they're facing that we begin to feel less compassion towards that individual and we just scroll past it because it's the same thing that we see all the time. I think second, we can become desensitized when we frequently see the bad news on the same level as trivial things. There's no delineation. There's no separation. And imagine scrolling through your Facebook feed or your social media feed and in one of the posts you read about a healthy new recipe that a friend had for dinner last night and in the very next post you read about another friend who recently lost a loved one. The next post is about a friend's new dog. We can kind of understand the issue then because it's put upon the same level, or at least that's the way we might perceive it. So I think quickly these serious issues going on in the lives of those around us kind of get swallowed up in the post of the mundane. We begin to grow numb towards some of the pain that's affecting friends and family because It's presented to us on the same level as date nights and political cartoons. So in order for us to stop this growing desensitization within our culture, we need to look at compassion from a biblical perspective. And as we see that's prescribed for us in God's Word, and we need to disconnect to make sure that we don't become like the world around us. I think this idea of growing numb comes from the concept of self-preservation and maybe perhaps even for our mental health because it can be overwhelming because sometimes it seems like when you turn on the news, that's all you see. And there's literally been times as I've watched the evening news and I try to keep up on things that are going on in our country because those things also affect the way I preach and things that we need to address. But sometimes because these things are so prevalent, they hurt as they should. They should make us feel something to stir within us that compassion, that need to act, and we're going to discuss that too, because we have to remember that when you think about the concept of compassion that we're going to discuss, especially the biblical concept of compassion, it's more than a feeling. First, let me say this. Compassion certainly is a feeling. The Greek word in the New Testament for compassion literally means to be moved in the inward parts. So, In that culture in the first century, they thought of your inward parts as the seed of love and pity or the seed of your affections. So it's the feeling someone describes when they say, I'm sick to my stomach for them. So that's what it means to be moved in your inward parts, that seed of affection, because it's deep down within your soul, so to speak. And it's the feeling that we describe, again, when we say that I'm sick to my stomach, that's the idea of compassion. Compassion as described in the Bible is certainly a feeling, but for some of us, you know, we can't help get, but get stirred up emotionally uh, when we see someone that's hurting or in need or someone that responds to the invitation of the gospel, right? I've always, always um, looked to my mother in the area of compassion. She's such a compassionate and, and loving person who feels and hurts when other people hurt. And I've seen my mother moved to tears and you know that then affects me many of us don't have to work on the emotional aspect of compassion because it's natural in us however christ-like compassion does not result in just feelings and we can look to jesus for the example with that compassionate people are not those who just simply sit around feeling bad for people That's not what it means to have compassion. But I'm afraid when we become numb because of our culture and society, this is exactly what takes place. We have to remember when we look to Jesus, we see the example of compassion that then results in action. Eight times in the gospel accounts, it's recorded that Jesus had compassion for a person or for a group of people. Want to guess how many times that compassion was accompanied by action? Every single time. Christ's compassion was not merely a feeling. When he felt compassion, he healed. When he felt compassion, he taught. He never just felt bad for people. His compassion always led to action. 
It's the same example that's given for us in the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, it says there's that word we're considering, compassion. The feeling of compassion then drove him to action. He bandaged the man up, he took him to town, found a place for him to stay, paid for his expenses. So that compassion led to action. Some of us are more feeling-oriented than others, and I understand that, and there's nothing wrong with that. None of us will all be stirred emotionally in the same way when it comes to certain situations. The great part about action is that regardless of whether you are feeling as compassionate as someone else, it's how you take action based upon your compassion. Because compassion must be in action. If you're like me, the problem is not always that you lack the desire to act on your feeling of compassion. Sometimes I'm just not sure what to do. You don't want to do the wrong thing. You don't want to say the wrong thing. In some situations, we may, not even, we may even feel like there's nothing that we can do. But I don't think that's always the case, though. I know sometimes people have said, I, I want to do something, I just don't know what to do. And our hearts are always in the best place with the best of intentions. But it's not always just about doing something in relation to being active, but it's putting the compassion into action. And sometimes it's just simply being present. But I think one of the first things that we can do to put that compassion into action, and I know it's really simple, is prayer. James 5, verses 13 through 15 Is anyone among you suffering? What's it say? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs to be happy for that person. Is anyone among you sick? What's it say? Call the preacher? No, it says, let him call for the elders of the church that they may pray over him. That's what the leadership is here for. That's compassion. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. It's very important for us to understand the elders play a significant part in our spiritual lives. I mean, God gave them the rule over us. They are to have compassion for us. Acts 20 and verse 28 says that they're to take heed to the flock of which God has made them the overseers. So they're looking out for us. They, they have compassion for us. So is not the very best thing that we can do first and foremost for a person is pray? James wrote that prayer should be our first response when someone's suffering. But he goes on to say in James 5 and verse 16, that verse we all know very well, right? Confess your trespasses one to another, to pray for one another, that, you're, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. So James stresses the idea of how important it is for us to pray. Simple in the idea, yet sometimes I think we forget how powerful prayer is. Prayer is the first response because prayer works. I would offer a word of caution, though, when it comes to prayer. I've often made the mistake of telling people that I would be praying for them only to realize that I never did pray. And I'm embarrassed to admit that, but I'm always going to point the finger first at myself. And I would assume that I'm not the only person that's made that mistake. It's easy for us to post on Facebook, well, you know, I'm praying for you, but then we never do. If you're going to... comment on a recent status, a tweet or Instagram picture to let them know that you're praying for them, take time right away to actually pray. I think sometimes we think this idea of prayer has to be this long, drawn-out, eloquent, um, you know, idea in which we saturate it with these words perhaps we don't even understand the definition to. There are some people I listen to that are such wonderful prayers, and I think of myself as being inadequate sometimes, but God doesn't care about how eloquent you are when you pray. A prayer could be something as simple when someone's struggling as, Father, we pray for this person who is struggling. Father, watch over them, love them, help us to be compassionate towards them, help them through these difficult trials. That's it. It doesn't need to be this long, drawn-out idea or concept of prayer. You know, even Moses struggled with his words, and God said, I'll help you with that. And so we have someone who makes intercession to us And that's God or the Holy Spirit that brings those prayers before God. And so don't simply promise to say say a prayer and then don't intend to pray. When you do that, I'm afraid sometimes perhaps we're posting 
only to be seen of men. But not only is prayer important first and foremost, it's then being of service to someone who's struggling. I think there are many ways that you can serve someone or a group of individuals when you feel compassion towards them. Encouragement is extremely important, and, and we need to encourage people personally. What do I mean personally? Don't encourage them just over Facebook or social media. When people are struggling, it goes much further when we reach out to them. Go visit them. Give them a call. I know this concept of phone calls seems to be foreign now because when I was growing up, that was a huge way in which we communicated. There was no electronic way to communicate. You picked up a phone or you went to that person. And so when people are struggling, it goes a lot further when we reach out to show that we care and that we have compassion. And when we visit them and make a call, we're making it personal. I'm sure sometimes we don't know what to say. There are times even I, as a gospel preacher, don't always know what to say. But sometimes you just, or we just putting in the effort to make it personal by reaching out and saying, hey, I'm just calling to make sure you're okay and checking on you. Just want you to know I love you and I'm thinking about you. That encouragement goes a tremendous or, or means a tremendous amount to people and goes a long way. If you look at Christ's example in Luke chapter 7 and verse 13, when Jesus came to the city of Nan where he found a woman who was mourning the death of her son. And in Luke 7 and verse 13, it states that Jesus had compassion for the woman. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. He said to her, do not weep. So what's the first thing that Jesus did before he raised and healed or brought her son back to life? Something we know we can't do. He encouraged that woman personally. Why? Because he was moved by compassion. That means he was stirred in his inner parts. He, he cared for that person, as we should. Christ understood the need for an encouraging word. That's such a huge thing for us as Christians. So we need to understand how important encouragement is. That shows compassion. To reach out and say, I just want you to know I love you. I'm thinking about you. You're going to get through this. And I'm here if you need me. And that brings me to the next point of service is to fulfill a need for someone. But I have a bad habit of throwing around the phrase, let me know if there's something that I can do when someone's going through a difficult time. It's not a bad habit because the statement is bad. The idea behind it is a good one. It's bad when we make statements like that. And, and I mean, I know that those statements come from a genuine place. However, I found that many times an individual's not going to ask or come back and ask for something. A lot of that has to do with pride or we don't want to put someone out so we don't ask. And sometimes I think we can, when we say it so often, it becomes an empty statement. Hey, let me know if there's anything I can do for you. I'm here if you need me, just as I made the statement just a few moments ago. It's as if we say we feel like we've done our part when we make that statement. Maybe it makes us feel good because the offer is there, now it's on them. If we really want to show compassion, we need to take action. Rather than simply making an offer, we need to look for a need that we can meet, and then we need to meet that need. And sometimes you don't always need to ask permission. And sometimes you'll even do something for someone and they'll say, well, you didn't need to do that. I had a, a wonderful uh, lady say to me one time that she had done something for me when I was preaching in Alabama and she had done something for me. And I said, well, you didn't need to do that. Her statement was, and which I've always carried with me to this day, was don't steal my blessing." And that's such a true statement when you think about it. It's a blessing for us as Christians when we're moved with compassion to do something for someone. Why? Because we care. Because we love them. Because we want to help them. And so when we think about this idea of fulfilling a need, we don't always need to ask when we fulfill that need. You're not going to get any in, into any trouble for doing it. I'm pretty sure about that. But... Think about it. Do they need a meal? Do they need a babysitter? Do they need an extra hand? Does their grass need to be mowed? Find something practical to do for them and just do it. Rather than making a blanket statement, find a specific way to help that person. Consider Matthew 15 and verse 32. It says, Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and they don't have anything to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. 
They had nothing to eat. Jesus saw a need and he met it. There's our example. Jesus didn't say, would you guys like something to eat? You know, would you like me to whip something up for you over here? Jesus saw they needed something and he just did it. We remember, we have to remember that people aren't always going to ask for help, but we know they need help. And it's always a blessing to us when we can fulfill a need for someone. And many times we can fulfill a need for someone without ever being recognized. I think that's a wonderful blessing. There are so many people in the congregation that help so many meet people in many ways, yet they never know who's helping them. Because they don't need to be seen of anyone. They just want to fulfill a need. And so we have to remember that's important for us when we have compassion and when we're moved. But we also have to remember, and I think this is very important for us as Christians, remember the spiritual aspect to all of this. We understand how important it is to meet the physical needs when we see those needs. But we also need to remember that the greatest need everyone has is Christ. Compassion should not be limited to something that we feel towards those who are hurting physically. When there are those who are lost or who are struggling in their walk with Christ, those things should bring us and stir us and be moved by compassion as well. In Mark chapter 6, we read about Jesus feeding another large crowd in verse 34. And Jesus, when he came out, it said that he saw a great multitude. Again, he was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. Jesus saw that need, spiritually speaking. They had something that needed to be met. And when Jesus saw those who were in need spiritually, he felt compassion towards them. You see, we're quick to notice the needs of others because those things are visible because we can see them physically. But we need to be quick to respond to the physical needs of others and use those opportunities to bring those individuals closer to Christ. Because ultimately our responsibility is to save souls, right? To, to seek and to save those that are lost. That was Jesus' number one mission. But we can still have compassion while we do it. Remember your motives, though. Listen closely to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Like I mentioned just earlier, we're not praying and making a post on Facebook just to be seen of individuals. Well, I'm praying for you. We're not doing it when we say, let me know if there's anything you need by posting that on a social media feed to be seen of men. Jesus said, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men. Again, like I said, a lot of people are doing things for members of the church that no one ever knows that they do it. This won't be the last time that I say this, but before you post anything online, ask yourself this question. Why am I posting this? Your answer may very well be, I'm trying to encourage this person or I want to show support for this person. But I think if we're honest with ourselves, our answer can also sometimes be, I want others to see my compassion. Uh, I want to be noticed. I don't want to be the only person who doesn't say anything. And we might not say those things out loud, but if we're honest with ourselves, we may be guilty of it from time to time. All of us are. There's a term currently being used online that's called slacktivism. Have you heard this term? Slacktivism is defined as the practice of supporting a political or social cause by means such as social media or online petitions, petitions characterized as involving very little effort or commitment. So it's a growing term because there are many people who want to speak out about the hurt going on in the world, but here's the thing. They're not doing anything about it. It's easy for us to hide behind the anonymity, so to speak, of our social media accounts and profess to be these great people without ever really doing anything about it. But when we profess our love as, as Christians, when we profess the love of Christ, Christ calls us to action, right? We're called out of the world, but we also have to remember that we're trying to save the world that we're called out of. And it's easy for us to change our profile pictures to the flag of a country that's hurting, and it's relatively simple to post that we've contributed to the latest GoFundMe account. There's nothing wrong with doing those things either. Don't get me wrong. We just need to be mindful of our motives. Are we doing these things because we're trying to make a difference? 
or are there other motives at work here? That's the devil working. And so we just need to remember we shouldn't take action just so that we can be seen. The kind of action is not, or rather that kind of action is not driven by compassion. It's driven by pride and self and self-motivation. So if it's true compassion, we don't care who sees. All the more reason to do it privately. Because I think it's going to mean more to us when we do it in such a way that we know we're glorifying God, but we're not looking for praise. We're not looking for rewards. We don't want to get a cookie out of this. We do it because we love our fellow Christians. We do it because we love mankind. We do it because we love lost souls. And we do it because we love Christ. And so while our culture may be becoming more and more desensitized to the troubles and pains of the world around us, we as Christians are called to be different from the culture. We are and should be counter-culture. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul wrote about the new self that we are to put on in Christ. He began by listing the wicked characteristics that need to be set aside, and then he continued by giving us several things that we need to put on. And he says... He says, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, or perhaps your translation says compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. First on the list is tender mercies or compassion towards one another. We are in Christ. Our compassionate hearts towards one another should separate us from the culture around us, counterculture. We cannot allow ourselves to become desensitized to the pain and the lives of those around us, no matter how often we see it and who it might be. Christ understood, as we should, the value of each person. He loved everyone, and that love caused the compassion that he felt for every soul that he saw. And so we have to make sure, then, that we see people through the eyes of Christ, that we're stirred by compassion and Let's not just settle for feelings either. To see someone struggle or in need to feel bad for the person does them no good. In some way, in the same way Christ turned compassion into action. We can say, well, I feel good for them. Christ addressed this when he said, well, there's a brother who's in destitute and without clothes. Send him on his way. Sorry, I feel bad for you. Christ said, that doesn't do anything for them. Pray for those who are struggling. Look for the physical and the spiritual needs that you can help meet and meet those needs. You don't always have to ask for permission. Show others the same compassion that Christ has shown towards us of why we're free from our past sins and transgressions. However, seeing those things may require us, and here's the key, seeing those people around us who are hurting, seeing the world around us struggle and go through the difficulties that we're facing in our society right now, requires us to look up from our screens and to reconnect with those around us. It means we have to put down our phones. It means we have to put down our computers and our tablets. And it means we have to pay attention to those that are hurting. There was a study that was done, I read not too long ago, um, concerning or asking the question of whether or not social media is actually social. And the study came to the conclusion that only 4% of those individuals, or 4% of the individuals using uh, social media 4% rather of that time was only in some type or form of communication through messaging or something like that. Everything else was done by passive communication or passive scrolling, it was called. So just scrolling through your Facebook or your feeds, but we're not socially interacting with individuals. That's where we have to disconnect and we have to reconnect. Remember, Christ sat down with individuals who were hurting. Brethren, we have to do the same thing. If we have the same love for mankind that Christ did, as we look and we have these difficult conversations, as we try and help those that are struggling, we're also showing them the love of Christ and praying that we bring them to Christ. Our actions speak volumes, and we have to remember that. So this week, I challenged you last week to have a social media fast. And I want you to ask yourself honestly how you think that went. Do you think you did a good job with that? That 48-hour fast of laying it aside, perhaps you want to try it again this week. You didn't last too long. That's okay. I understand. But this week, I want to challenge you to disconnect from your social media. I'm not saying to stop using it or to take a 48-hour fast, 
and I want you to reconnect with those around you, whether it's in your neighborhood, whether it's a past family member, but I want you to reconnect and to reach out, to call someone. I know we have to be careful in the time of this virus. We can't go visit people like we did, and that's a, that's a hard thing. But we can also call people and physically pick up your phone and call someone and tell them that you're just thinking about them. Hey, I'm thinking about you and I love you. Hearing someone's voice sometimes can soothe the soul when someone's hurting. And you calling someone who you don't even know is hurting might help them tremendously. Remember to shine your lights. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Pray this has helped you. Certainly pray you have a blessed remainder of your week, that you stay healthy, stay strong, stay safe. Remember to reach out to each other. Pray for our elders. Pray that they might have the wisdom and knowledge of understanding of continuing to make the decisions that keep us safe and keep us healthy and that keep us moving forward in the right direction. Praying that we can be back together soon. Take care. I love you. I miss you. God bless.